Professor Fiona McMillan. Thank you, Adam. Thank you very much. Remember how to work the thing. Tap something, isn't it? Okay. I'm still recovering a bit from the disappointment of discovering that Mars bars are not made in peppermint <laughs> now, which is what I thought the picture was about. So um, it just goes to show that um, we all have a different way of seeing things. Now, this first picture that I have here, <coughs> my slides, is a is a is a, a photo of a Swiss man or the back of a Swiss man called Tim who is sitting in uh, the Mona, um, is a museum in, it's very hard for me as a person from Sydney not to make a joke about this uh, museum, the Museum of Old and New Art, anyway, in um, uh, Tasmania. Um, and he did this sitting completely still for six hours a day from 2011 to 2020. And when you think about that, you'll realise that that was all also during the pandemic. So he also sat there when no one could come in and see him. Okay, he sat in this museum like this, completely still, six hours a day. Now, Tim, or Tim's back, um, is the canvas for a work of art, as you can see, in the form of a tattoo, which was made by the Belgian artist um, Wim Delvoye. Um, completed, he started it in 2006 and completed it in 2008. Or, as a lot of journalists wrote about this, Tim is an artwork by Wim Delvoy. That's a bit of a significant difference. Okay, now Delvoy sold this work of art to the German collector Rick Reinking. That also doesn't sound like a real name, but apparently <laughs> it is. Um, for 150,000 euro, um, and it is report. It was reported in the press that Tim um, was paid a third of this sum, 50,000 euro. Um, as part of a contractual arrangement, and as part of this arrangement, he agreed to sit in this in the gallery um, three times a year. Under this contract, it is reported, it is reported, um, when he dies, his skin, or presumably the skin on his back, um, will be removed and preserved as a canvas. Okay, who that contract is with, how long it lasts, what exactly it says, is all, of course, a private question. It's all a private question. Now, I'm going to come back and say more about Tim. Um, these are also proprietary images. So another interesting thing is here you can't find non-proprietary images of this. Um, but uh, since um, we're ignoring that for the moment, you can have a look at them. I'll say more about uh, the story of Tim a little in a moment. But what we should note at this stage, and this is uh, where I want to start really, looking at this as a critical commercial law scholar, or critical scholar of private law, what we see underpinning all of the things that I've just told you about are two of the great institutions of globalized Western law in the 19th century, um, rolled out to the rest of the world. The great moment of commercial law was um, the ascendancy of private property, uh, private property relations, and freedom of contract. And these two things were achievements of a law long before anyone talked about human rights or even constitutionalism or all those sorts of things. So, so these are this kind of this great moment of law. Okay, so I'll come back to that. But we're, we're focusing on these two things, uh, private property relations and freedom of contract. Okay. Now, looking at my next slide, the strange story of Tim, Wim, and Rick is also a real-life version of a short story, uh, a satirical short story written by the wonderful um, English writer Saki, whose actual name was H.H. H. Munro. Um, and this, is, this, is, this story is a satire, but it, again, it brings, it, it's a satire on the operation of private property and the operation of freedom of contract. It also adds a few complications to those uh, stories, which still haunt, the, which haunt both of those concepts today. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit of, about uh, Saki's story, the background. Um, in this story, we have an unfortunate commercial traveller um, called Henri Depli, who comes from Luxembourg, and he's travelling around Europe, and he finds himself in northern Italy, 
having inherited a bit of money, he goes out on a bender. And as a result of that, he finds himself in what's described as a small town in northern Italy. And he decides to, quote, patronize local art by getting a tattoo from someone called Andres Pincini, who, Saki tells us, was perhaps the most brilliant master of tattoo craft that Italy had ever known. And if you've ever been to Italy recently, you'll know there's a lot of masters of tattoo craft there. Um, now, he, pays, he agrees to pay Pincini 600 lira, I imagine. Uh, it says francs, but probably was lira. Um, to cover, to cover Pincini's back with a tattoo of the fall of Icarus. This is a, and this is a, a, one, of many, um, one of many possible depictions of the fall of Icarus. Okay. The plea is very, very happy with the end result, although he's, he's happy with the painting, but he's a little bit unhappy because he thinks that Icarus is actually a fort that was taken by the Germans in the Thirty Year War, not, a, not, a, um, and not, not this person falling from the sky. So he's a bit disappointed, but still, he, um, he's, he becomes very happy because everyone who sees his back says what a wonderful work of art it is. But it's also the tattoo artist Pincini's last work of art because being a little bit dissolute, he dies before Pincini pays him. Pincini then discovers that the result of his bender, drinking so much, was he has no money to pay Pincini's widow. And that starts a whole lot of new problems because Pincini's widow rescinds the contract between um, Pincini and Depli uh, and says that now she's going to present this tattoo to the municipality of Bergamo, which is the small... Okay. Uh, now... Dipli wisely makes an exit at this point, but as Saki tells us, um, he bore on his back the burden of the dead man's genius, so on and so forth. He was hustled by a, a, a proprietor in a, a steam bath who emphatically refused to allow the celebrated fall of Icarus to be publicly on view without the permission of the mu municipality of Bergamo. Um, there's more publicity and so on and so forth. Uh, Deblis gets a bit hot during the summer in Rome, but no one will let him have a swim because there is a great fear that this important work of cultural heritage and or art um, might be injured by salt water. A perpetual injunction is obtained, uh, which debarred the much muchly harassed commercial traveller from sea bathing under any circumstances. Um, he thinks he's going to sneak away to Bordeaux. Okay, but... Actually, he can't because he stopped at the uh, French-Italian border um, and sternly reminded of the stringent law which forbids the exportation of Italian works of art. Now, the story goes on. There's a diplomatic fracas. Um, uh, Queen de, de Pincini turns out to be have a dubious private life and all this. But anyway, in the end, there's an enormous dispute between Italy and Germany and, in fact, the rest of Europe, which once did involve this country but not anymore, um, and De Police is, of course, terribly traumatized by this because this is his skin. Okay, um, and uh, Saki tells us that he drifted into the ranks of Italian anarchists until finally one day, in the heat of debate, a fellow anarchist spilt a corrosive liquid, notice the general discretion here, uh, corrosive liquid, on his back, completely obliterating Pincini's last work. The fellow anarchist receives a, a prison sentence for defacing a national art treasure, and Depli is deported. He ends up in Paris, where he walks around asking the Louvre um, to, to employ him because he is the lost arm of the uh, Venus de Milo. <laughs> okay, now, that's, that's, this, uh, that's uh, that story. Roald Dahl, who you might know a little bit more about, published a very similar story in The New Yorker in 1952. So Saki's story is 1912. Um, 1952, this story is more macabre. I think it's, uh, it's, it's less subtle and less satirical than Saki's, but definitely more macabre. So the Dahl story picks up where Saki's left off in the streets of Paris, and it tells the story of another famous tattoo artist, this time a French one, um, who gets drunk, apparently tattooed art, tattoo artists, uh, this is what they do, um, <laughs> according to these writers. Um, he gets drunk, and um, after a successful day of tattooing, he asks an unknown 
an artist who's a struggling, unknown artist, he asked this artist to paint a picture of the tattoo artist's wife on the tattoo artist's back, and then he describes to, the, to this artist, this struggling, unknown artist, he describes to him how to make this into a tattoo. Okay, what has to be done, what techniques, what's the art of the tattoo, uh, how we will obliterate the painting, but leave the tattoo, and so forth. Okay, now, uh, this all takes place uh, before the First World War. In the interwar period, this unknown artist starts to become very famous. The tattoo artist, on the other hand, falls on hard times. His wife's uh, killed in a bombing raid in the Second World War. Um, he becomes destitute. Wandering the streets of Paris after the Second World War, um, with the painting on his back, just like uh, in the other two examples, he sees a painting in the window of an art gallery, and he recognizes the style. And he sees that this painting and this gallery is dedicated to somewhat this unknown artist who's now become very famous. So the person who painted the painting on his back and transformed it into a tattoo has now become terribly famous. And this art tattoo artist is destitute. He enters into the gallery and he shows the gallery owner his back. And the gallery owner recognizes that this is not a real thing, this is a style story. Okay, maybe it's a real thing. Um, he, uh, the gallery owner recognizes the style, and lots of people start crowding around, saying that they, what, because now this work is really valuable, the work of this artist. Okay, and various people make various bids for this person, or his back, or his skin. Okay, but two bids in particular Dahl writes about. Okay, one bid is for a person who says that he will pay for this um, a skin on the back of this man to be removed and a skin graft to be put on. I oh, know it gets worse. Okay, um, another bid is from somebody very smooth who says they are the proprietor of the Hotel Bristol in Cannes. And they say that they will pay this man, this, our, our poor tattoo artist fallen on hard times, to come and live in the hotel, drink cocktails, do whatever he likes, only in return for exposing his back so that people can see this incredibly famous and valuable work, work of art. Now, as you can probably guess from this story, the tattoo artist, of course, takes up the offer of, I'll go and drink lots of cocktails and expose my back to the world and I'll have a lovely life. Okay. Dahl ends this story by telling us there is no uh, Hotel Bristol in Cannes, mm -hmm. but several months later, um, uh, uh, sorry, several weeks later, a heavily varnished painting matching the description of the tattoo turns up in an auction in Buenos Aires. Okay, and this is, a, this is why I say it's an uh, even more macabre story. Now, yes, I know, they're horrible stories. Okay, but there are actually also very interesting stories if you're an intellectual property lawyer or a copyright, copyright scholar like me, they're interesting for what they tell us about, well, in fact, there's a lot of interesting things about them, but for what they tell us about um, private, property, private property relations. Um, and they're also interesting for what they tell us about freedom of contract. And what I thought that I would do, because I don't want to go on for too long, is to tell you that for me, they pose a whole lot of questions about commercial law and its base in this idea of the sanctity of property relations and uh, the sanctity of freedom of contract. And some of these questions that I'm about to mention to you are questions that the law has an answer for, but I'm not sure that the answer is the right answer. Okay, so I wrote about, um, in a shameless act of self-promotion, I wrote about... Um, Saki's story, so let's go back to Saki's story now. We've done the advertising. Saki, I wrote about Saki's story in the book I just showed you a, a picture of. Um, because Saki is clearly, amongst other things, satirizing the concept of intellectual property, this idea that you mix your uh, intellectual labor with an object, and the object then becomes yours, because that is what we intellectual property lawyers say. That's what we say happens. This is the famous 
uh, philosophy of John Locke, which has been adopted, not really abused by intellectual property scholars because Locke liked the idea as well. This idea that when you create um, a work that becomes subject to property relations, what you're doing is you are mixing your own creativity with something that already exists, and in that way, you own the final product. Okay, so, so um, Saki, of course, is satirizing that, but he's also satirizing something else in this story. He's satirizing the idea of national cultural property. So not just intellectual property, but also the idea of national cultural property or cultural heritage and so forth. Now, the story picks up a theme of... Um, if we go back to this, this quote, this, this is a fantastically funny story, by the way. The Dahl's story is really macabre, whereas this is really is really amusing, um, amusing story. But um, he, he, Saki picks up one of the themes of intellectual property law, also examining this, this idea of genius. Because one of the things that we always say, sorry, I don't always say it, people who want to justify intellectual property say is that, of course, uh, what justifies giving property rights is this kind of this, gen this genius. The intellectual property is born in a period when there's this discourse of the individual genius, okay, who's giving something to us. He's giving, he's giving us his genius. So um, Saki picks this up in, a, in the way in which the expression of genius in a material form on the back of um, Dipley converts the surface on which it's inscribed into a property into, or into property. Um, he raises the questions about um, what is the property? Okay, what is the property here? Is it the tattoo? Is it Dipley's back? Is it the whole of Dipley? Or is it, as intellectual property lawyers would probably say, the right to reproduce the tattoo? Um, so he raises that question. But um, he also, but a really big question is, okay, is, has, has Dipley... As with Tim in our first example, if we go back to the beginning, has Tim become the property of Rick Reinking, the unlikely name Rick Reinking? Okay, um, but Saki's story, I think, also um, investigates, actually, let's just stay with Tim for a moment, investigates how this, this activity, and in particular, if we go back to Saki, um, gives rise to competing claims. Because in this story, not only has Depley's interest in his own body been subsumed in the work created by Pincini, and of course it's a work of fiction, so we don't know what it looked like. This is just to give you an idea of what might have been at stake. Not only um, has this interest been subsumed, but his right over his body has been subsumed partly by private property relations and partly by this question of cultural property or cultural heritage. So... He's been turned into somebody else's private property, but he's also been turned into a contested site of state heritage, which is quite a lot for one person to bear, really. Um, so these two claims, these two different claims, the private property claim and the cultural heritage claim, um, now irretrievably mixed with the body of our poor Dipley, set, set the work, this tattoo on Dipley's back, off in, on two different trajectories. On the one hand, uh, um, uh, Depley's back has become the private property of Pincini and then his wife as his heir. Um, and on the other hand, the cultural significance of this tattoo made by the greatest tattoo artist in Italy and so forth um, makes Depley's back this site of contestation at the local level between Bergamo and the rest of Italy and then between Italy Saki tells us, Italy, Germany, France, and the rest of Europe. Now, in the story, Saki actually partially dilutes the problems that this might raise because, um, because as I said to you, De Plis widow decides to transfer the work to the municipality. So she transfers the property and the work to the municipality, which means they have both the private property, the intellectual property, and also the cultural heritage um, property. But the heritage claim, of course, is a big problem. So he makes a lot of jokes about this, all the different levels, who thinks they've got an interest in the heritage claim represented by national, local, supranational entities. Um, and then, of course, there's this wonderful part in this story where Dupli is liberated by an anarchist, perhaps, um, 
perhaps Saki here, is reminding us of the contestability, if not more, of all these political structures as forms of community. But that sounds like a thing that a critical lawyer would say, and probably Saki wasn't thinking that at all. But that's what I think might be the significance of it. Okay, now the other thing that this story offers us, offers us is a different reading of the idea of cultural heritage or property. And this is something that I work on a lot, um, because it's not something, this idea of cultural heritage or property is not something old and dusty on a museum shelf, um, it's, or a picturesque ruin of the sort that uh, Dipley thought he was going to have painted on his, or tattooed on his back. It's something absolutely contemporary, okay, then as now. And tattoo art as we know now is also something absolutely contemporary. It's vaguely outside then, and I think prob maybe still now, we'll say more, we can say more about this, outside the mainstream of artistic production, and perhaps outside a certain type of received cultural respectability. So the story is ironically putting into question a notion of what cultural heritage might be. Okay, cultural heritage, cultural property might be. Um, but it also, of course, puts into question a whole lot of other issues, and Enrique mentioned some of these uh, in his presentation, um, that both intellectual property as a private property right and cultural heritage or cultural property, a whole lot of other issues um, that, that form the groundwork of these property rights. Okay, so he reminds us of the tangibility-intangibility distinction. Here we've got a very tangible thing. This thing is on someone's back. It can't be removed from it. So what does that mean? How do we understand this as an intangible thing if we think intellectual property rights are, are intangible? And in fact, intellectual property scholars know, and Rick was talking about this, that this tangible, intangible distinction is a monster in intellectual property because it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't, it's, it's hard to, to understand in real life. Um, the story also questions the distinction between what's movable and what's immovable, which is another big, um, a big part of the underpinning of property law in generally. Of course, the tattoo could be moved from Depley's back. And as we know from Dahl's macabre story, the suggestion is the tattoo was removed from the tattoo artist's back. Um, and as we know, as I said to you, eventually that is what's going to happen to Tim. When he shuffles off the mortal coil, he'll also shuffle off a bit of his own skin immediately. So, um, so we've got this question about the division between what's movable and immovable. Um, Dupli, in, in Saki's story, uh, Dupli can move himself, but he can only move himself carrying this burden of genius on his back. Now, similar problems of movement affect Tim in our first example, because he's contracted to be in certain places at certain times. Um, Saki's story, I think, also tells us something about the Western obsession with conservation, which is a good thing. Conservation's a good thing. We believe in the West as the opposite of destruction, which we believe is a bad thing. Um, uh, Dupli suffers all sorts of privations in the name of conservation. And we see here that Tim is also suffering all sorts of privations in the name of being conserved and curated as a museum piece. Um, even, I think, in Saki's story, we have this discourse of the authentic and the fake, um, uh, and, and perhaps this political intervention by the anarchist tells us that. Okay, now, taken together, these three examples, and the really interesting thing, right, is that these two stories, okay, prefigure an actual thing that happened. It, well, sorry, it hasn't happened to Tim yet that he's lost his back, but he's, uh, he's become a, a work of art. Taken, taken together... I think they give us a lot of questions to think about, about the relationship, about this idea of the primacy of private property and the primacy of freedom of contract, which, as I said, are the two central pillars of commercial law. And I want to just pose a few of these questions. Law, as I said, has some answers to some of the questions I'm about to pose, but I'm not sure that they're the right answers. And I'm not going to tell you what they are because questions are always much better than answers. And the older I get, because I think this might have been actually a crescendo in terms of age, this uh, panel, <laughs> the older I get, 
the more I'm interested in questions and the less I'm interested in answers. Okay, so here are some of the questions that, uh, that occur to me, and perhaps other, others occur to you. Is a tattoo an artwork protected uh, by intellectual property law? Or, is the, or are the categories of artworks now closed and too rigid to embrace tattoo protection? Uh, what role does genius play here? Can you have, is there some reason why a genius can't be a tattooist? Do they have to be a person who paints on canvas? Okay. What In Dahl's story, what is the work of art? Was it the painting that the artist first made, or was it the tattoo that was traced over the painting, or was it both? And if it was both, what does that mean? Was the tattooist in Dahl's story free to make the deal that he thought he was making with the Bristol hotel owner? Perhaps he was already owned by the artist. Perhaps he wasn't free. Perhaps he didn't have the ability to sell himself to the hotel. Um, assuming that the painting that turns up, painting in inverted commas, that turns up in Buenos Aires is, um, is the skin from the tattooist. Who owns that? Who owns the physical property in it? Who owns the intellectual property in it? Another question. Can we just invent new forms of property? So at the moment, one of the worst things in my life is trying to understand NFTs, non-functional tokens. Why? Because you take a photo of something and you put it on blockchain and you say it's a property right. Okay, well, someone just invented that. Well, people are investing in that invented property. So can we just invent new forms of property? Perhaps all this intellectual property stuff we don't need to worry about. If a tattoo is a copyright protected work, which is, which is always more or less irretrievably mixed with the body of a living person, what are the implications for the ownership of a body? What limits should apply to private property rights? What, is Tim a type of a slave? Has he sold himself into indentured labor in this uh, thing? Or perhaps Tim should be considered a performer for the purposes of intellectual property law or copyright law. If he's a performer, who owns the rights in his performance? How does identifying something as cultural heritage, and notice we're here in a museum here, so we've already got the odour of cultural heritage hanging over the top. How does identifying something as cultural property or cultural heritage change the exercise of, of private property rights, rights in relation to it? Does it affect the freedom to enter into contracts in relation to it? Okay, and then if we say a bit about contract, what should be the limits on freedom of contract? If it's not lawful to make a contract to sell your body parts, which is what everyone's always telling us all the time, if it's not lawful, can you make a contract to turn your skin into the private property of somebody else? Can you make a contract to be skinned after death and that to become someone else? If not, can tattoos ever be protected by copyright? Okay, how should we understand Tim's contract, since this is a real case, with Delvoy and Ryan King? Uh, is it some type of employment contract, this payment that he took? Is it a consultancy agreement? Is it a contract to render services? What regulatory mode should the law have here? And then, of course, there's another fantastic question that hovering over all of this, which is, um, did Dahl plagiarize Saki's story? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, which everybody knows Dahl's story, right? But few people know Saki's story. And if he did, what's the difference between plagiarism and breach of copyright? Um, what about Delvoy? Did he take the idea from these stories? If he did, what does it matter? What are the impl implications? Okay, and I'll finish there. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>